it worships it's not a genre of music you know I get very upset when it appears in a category of music and and awards and things I'm like it's not a genre yeah this is a life it's not even a lifestyle Mm -hmm. it's our lives poured out The Profile with Premier Christianity magazine. Hello and welcome to The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio. I'm Jemima Wright, Deputy Editor of Woman Alive magazine. The Profile is the show where we sit down with a well-known Christian to hear more about their life, faith and ministry. It's brought to you by the UK's leading Christian magazine, Premier Christianity. The monthly title features more interviews just like this one, the latest news, reviews, columnists and more. Discover more and check out our best subscription offers now at premierchristianity.com. Today on the show, I'm speaking to Australian singer-songwriter Darlene Cech. 30 years ago, she wrote the well-known worship song, Shout to the Lord. We spoke about her journey of coming to faith, of being a famous child in Australia her recovery from breast cancer, and the amazing story of God being close to her in a time of deep suffering. Let's listen now. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you, because this morning, in preparation to talking to you, I have been, I put Darlene Check on Spotify, and I've had song after song of worship song, and especially listening to Shout to the Lord, there is something, I know we're going to talk about that because it's 30 years old, but I just found myself arms in the air worshiping god and i listened to something that you said about it's 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 a song worshiping god it's not it's not telling god how we feel about him it's telling god who he is um so i wonder if yeah. we can just jump straight in yeah to talking about yeah that of course were you about 28 when it came out from Figuring? yeah can yeah. you tell us about where you were, what happened, and the story behind it? Yeah, like I was um, had two little girls, little tiny munchkins who are all older now with their own families, um, and, you know, singing at church, learning how to worship lead. I wasn't worship leading all the time. Um, I was quite nervous about stepping into that role, but learning how to do that, and, you know, I just... One day I was very, very frustrated. I think Mark and I were both, we had this such a desire to be in church ministry um, full time and there was just no way that that was ever going to happen as far as what we could see. We had a business and I was singing jingles and we were, you know, doing all the things as you do. Um, And I just remember one day, because we got this bill, the horrendous bill, and I uh, just remember sitting down at the piano and literally shout to the Lord is like between Psalm 95 and Psalm 100, and you'll find it in there. It just kind of weaves in and out of those scriptures, and I literally, I didn't even write it. I literally just started singing it in worship, just like God, you know, there's none like you. I lay down my life again. It's like, ah, oh, I just, the ceaseless proclamation of the glory of God, like just entering in to that. Mm. And, um, yeah, I didn't even play it to anybody for a while. I was uh, not a very confident songwriter. I would probably still say the same thing now. Um, and, yeah, I just held on to it. And then I said to our worship pastor, and our music pastor at that time at Hillsong Church was a very small kind of, you know, hundreds of people, not multiplied thousands of people back then. And um, he said, well, play it. I said, I think I might have a song. And I made them stand with their backs to me because I was very, you know, I'd be, be like, my Jesus, my Saviour. Change that if you want to. I know it's not very good. Like I, I apologised the whole way through. And by the end, um, Jeff Bullock, who was our worship pastor, turned around and said, we're doing that this weekend. And I kind of, it left my mouth and it left my life. Wow. That's what I say about that song. 
Amazing. And and I can't even claim writing it. It just it's just flowed, just you know. So gosh. Yeah. So from that, did you then you were were you and your husband both able to work full time for the church after that? Or no, was that yeah, the same not time? for a no, not okay. for a long time. Um not for a long time. And then he, you know, he's always been a real marketplace minister. He's such a strategist, entrepreneurial. So he's done a lot of things. Um, and but both of us always like that's how we met in a band ministering in high schools when we wow. were like 17 and 18. Like when we we were both radically saved at 15 and 16 in very different places. And Really, since then, with a few detours along the way, you know, a few little prideful, selfish detours maybe along the way, and then some seasons of motherhood and all those things. Um, everything else, it's just that's what we've wanted to do. Just we really want to share the gospel. So, yeah. you know, my gift is in music and, and Mark's is in telling a story. You know, he's he's amazing in that in that frame. So, yeah. Wow. And here we are. Yeah, here you are. So um, with this interview, we'd like to go back to the beginning of a person's life. And I know you mentioned that you got saved. I think you, when you were a teenager. But before that, mm -hmm. um, I mm -hmm. heard someone say that you were famous as a, as a child in Australia. Is that right? Because of singing. Yeah, I was. I was on yeah. a kids TV show weekly from when I was 10. Wow. So we had to learn eight songs a week to record and film and sing. Um, and, yeah, I think that was like 36 weeks of the year we did that. Oh, my goodness. And Were you homeschooled? Yeah. No, I just didn't do very well. Yeah. <laughs> Homeschool wasn't a thing back yeah. then either, you know. You did, we didn't really know anybody who was doing it really well. Yeah. <laughs> so, um yeah, it just wasn't a thing back there. Not neither was child services, which probably yeah. should have should, they may have should have something. gotten involved. Yeah. But anyway, no, look, it was a it was a really it, it was quite an amazing time. And you know, I was still going to school and doing the things with my friends. My parents divorced in the middle of all that. So it to be honest, the rhythm of routine gave me a little bit of stability. Yeah. Um, and which I found through music, you know, which is quite amazing. And my, they would pick my voice. I've always loved harmonies. I never, ever thought I'd be singing out front of anything. I love harmonies. I love choir. I love arranging. I love all of that producing. I love everything in the background. So every week I would go to the studio on Sunday with this group of professional singers who would do all the backing vocals for these eight songs and I was the child's voice that they would put in the middle to sing along with them to give it a more childish sound and then all these years later you know I find myself in that world you know when it comes to like choir and backing vocals and 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 the artistry of worship and I just go, God, how, I don't know, God, how you did that, how you formed me for these moments. You know, that was all amazing, but actually it gave me an amazing experience to put into practice when we started recording and producing songs and, you know, I'm just like, God, I don't know how you do that, but you are good. Yes. You are really good. <laughs> you were prepared so. for it. But I think that's really interesting that you kind of, would prefer to be in the background but yet god put you forward always. um always yeah. i still prefer to be in the background yeah, yeah i love the background that's so um, interesting yeah yeah i um, know right because on the back of that god has a sense of humor yeah yeah but <laughs> it's kind of his grace because you're going to need him more to do it and I think what is difficult now is the whole thing with celebrity culture and fame and if you love being you know, there in the front, that's probably not good for your soul in the long run. So maybe it's a better place to be. Yeah. I think if you love, love it when it comes to worship, mm. it worships, it's, it's, it's not a genre, yeah. right? It's not a genre of music. It's not, you know, I get very upset when it appears in a category 
of music and and awards and things I'm like it's not a genre yeah this is a life it's not even a lifestyle Mm -hmm. it's our lives poured out you know whether we have the opportunity to lead that in a musical pattern which God has given you know every nation tribe and tongue the ability to enter into that world again by his grace but whether you are um, serving your children or your, you know, being your very best at work and all of those things, all of the, all of our lives is given, you know, as an offering of, of worship before God. If we look in Romans 12 and it's like, as I said, you know, when we first started talking, like entering into that ceaseless proclamation of the glory of God, mm-hmm. it's not a genre, <laughs> So, yeah, I think if you love the limelight, in the end, worship, because of what it's about, it will not allow you to stay wow. in that place. Yeah. And and that also is the grace of God. Mm. It also is the grace of God because, yeah. you know, he we, we can't treat the glory of God with that kind of, presumption familiarity all of those things because um i've heard it said that you know when man receives glory like we're we're built to carry it to give it to reflect the glory of god to but when we receive it and ingest it it's not a matter of if it's just a matter of when you will blow up because that's we were never built for that yeah we were built to reflect glory you know so yeah, I, I get a little bit feisty when, when it comes to these things. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, do you think that's why, you know, it's not so much worship leaders, but pastors all in, you know, in, from every denomination all around the world that we're seeing things explode? Yeah, yeah. do you think that's yeah, a connection? God won't, God won't be yeah. mocked yeah. in the end. He will yeah. not be mocked. And, and you know what? It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, we could do a big yeah. theological dive, which maybe we should because um, maybe not today, don't worry. Um, but I just, you know, when when man um, is without accountability, where we sit on a throne that is reserved for Christ, when we start to love our crowns that actually there to be cast before the feet of Jesus. If we read in Revelation, it's like um, it's only a matter of time before it goes wrong. You know, that that's never what the church was all about. It's not a wedding cake with the person on the top, you know. So no. it's the centrality of Christ. It just We have to just keep bringing it back to the simplicity, the centrality and the magnificence of Jesus yeah. at the centre of everything. So then to do a bit of a jump, so you ended up at Hillsong um, because yeah. you produced so many albums, wrote so many songs and wrote books as well. And then yeah. I think it was 2013, was that then that you found that you had breast cancer? Yeah, so we moved out of Hillsong. Um, I'd come off staff, I think, about 2008. Okay. Um, we were still there and I was still working as hard as ever. Um and then I think just at the end of 2010, we um, said yes to pastoring a little church on the Central Coast. Neither of us had heard of um, Charm Haven where this original campus was, but through a series of miracles um, and just, I guess, our hearts before God going, you know, you have our yes. It's a little bit scary. I don't know what, what it's going to look like, but anyway, you know, God really led us into saying yes to this church. And so we were on the Central Coast, which is about an hour north of where Hillsong is in a beautiful part of the world. Um, and, yeah, the end of 2013, the 13th of December was when I was diagnosed in 2013. Mm-hmm. And the 20th of December I had surgery And the 24th of December on Christmas Eve, I came home to prepare for chemo and radiation 
and the oncologist had two, I have, still have two professors and um, they're like, you need to give us a year of your life. Wow. I'm like, okay. okay. I didn't say it quite like that. Yeah. I, yeah. But, yeah, it, it was a 2014 was um, harrowing, Yeah, I would say. Yeah. I, I've heard you say also that God met you there. Can you share how he did, how he showed himself as God to you still, even when you're going through this? battle yeah. and valley oh, so yeah so many layers and levels yeah from speaking to me like the day before I went into surgery we were doing all our Christmas things at church and this beautiful woman who I trust and who's in our church now and she's a real prayer warrior and um I wanted to tell her and we hadn't told our church we told our our board and of course, our family, we just wanted to give our children and our family time to process, right? Um, and we didn't want the pressure of everybody else knowing, which we did tell everybody after I'd had surgery, after we had a little bit more of an understanding of what was in front of us and after our children we knew were dealing with it the best they could. So this woman, I said to her on the 19th, I said, Susanna, this is what's happening. And actually, I brought it with me. I'll show oh, you. Yeah. Um, she hands me this book, which is now very well, wow. well read, well yeah. worn, because I take it everywhere with me um, when I travel. And she goes, oh, okay, that makes sense. I'm like, that's a funny response. She gets into her purse and she pulls this out. She goes, yeah, the Lord has ha had me writing this book for you. Wow. On his promises for you and how much he loves you. I'm like, what? And I open it up and like right from, you know, before I told her on the 14th, which is the day after I find out, the 14th, she's like, um, hang on, where is it? This journal is a gift from your beautiful Jesus. Oh, wow. His heart burns. I have no idea, but God does. And so then she writes scriptures, prophetic words, and just fills it. Just she said, you know, he kept speaking to her. So from moments like that, which yeah. gave me such confidence mm. to, you know, the one of probably the hardest day. There was a couple of hard days where I almost died from the chemo, not the cancer. Mm. Um and I just fell by the side of my bed. Um, I just like I can't, I can't do this for another second. And on the floor, God met me. Mm. It just kind of wrapped me up in Him, and I don't even know what to say. That night, yeah. He it was like He coached me in breathing. It just like breathe in, breathe out, breathe in like so tender and real and powerful. So, you know, it's funny, isn't it? It's like even though I still wouldn't go, I'm so glad I had cancer. Like I still, I'm not that person, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't swap those moments yeah. for anything because mm. even now I get pain or I get, you know, I've come off medication. I've been off my medication now for about eight months and, Every now and again, you'll, you know, you have to go back to the cancer ward and all that. And mm. when fear could try to grab you and I just hear him like, breathe in, mm. breathe out. I'm like, oh. So, you know, I, 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 it's kind of taken that sting of death out for me. Wow. It's what for anyone who faces mortality like that mm -hmm. in one way or another. We all we all are gonna die at some point, but when you're faced with that, you you have to look, you have to dig deep, you have to really hear the Lord and really know what you believe about healing. You need to know what you believe about heaven. You need to, you know, you actually have to dig really deep into yeah. those things. And so all of that, I would not swap for a single thing. I can imagine. I, I think you said that there was one time, it was it an older lady from church came to your bedside and said, you you shouldn't be scared of death and this is why, and basically yeah. spoke, she spoke to me. 
about three yeah. hours, about wow. seven. And what the scripture says, and by the end of her conversation, she actually came to our home and I was just lying on the couch and now my girlfriends and some of the prayer warriors, they would just call in and pray and mm. do those things. And, um, yeah, by the end I was like, okay, I'm good to go now. Yeah, You know, and I think that's also why we need each other. Yeah. You know, when I had no strength or even the ability to dig deep for myself you know my my friends and my children were digging deep for me and kind of encouraging me to the very core of my being it's really hard to describe but I love the church I love the family of God I you'll never find me doing a podcast (laughs) rubbishing the church yeah because you know it's full of people like me so it's going to have lots of holes in it yeah um but Jesus said he's building his church and you know it's one of the beautiful things that God gives us um as a community of faith we we need each Mm. other but it is also then through us showing our love for one another and is one of the things that Jesus is going to use an example to the world, you know, and, and I think of some people always point out the terrible moments of the church, mm-hmm. but I think of all the millions of those moments that would have gone on today in the church at large and go, oh, I want to focus on those moments Yeah, where we can really shine the glory of God together. Someone says mm-hmm. the local church is the hope for the world. Yeah, I think that said, I think, you know, I, I go, well, Jesus is the hope yeah. of the world. But but Jesus, through his people, mm. the church, his hands and feet, it is. It's the, there's no other plan. Yeah. Like there's not a plan B and C and D. It's yeah. like this, this is it. So, yeah. hey, I'm going to do my best to encourage her. Mm. and make us strong that's good yeah. um I also I was listening to a recording of one of your um one of the songs where you there's a break in the recording where you speak out about cancer and you say I hate cancer mm-hmm. and you mm-hmm. sing, again sing the song over people um mm-hmm. which I thought was significant but I think that you said that you you did that before you actually got diagnosed is that right mm-hmm. yeah. yeah yeah about that- four months later I was diagnosed mm. Which was, you know, to be honest, I it, it was a really difficult um, thing because, you know, my sister-in-law at that time was battling cancer. She's with Jesus now. My a friend in our church was battling cancer. She's with Jesus now. And I'd really written that song with Israel Houghton mm. for this, these women. And I'm like, no, I hate yeah. cancer. I hate it. And... So when, you know, Bill um, um, Johnson, he was at a one of our friend's churches not far from us and I asked, I was going through treatment and I asked whether he would see me, um, which he did, and he sat down with Mark and I for a long time and just fathered us mm. through my fear. Yeah. And because I said, like, I'm, I'm always scared to see speak out like even to lead worship how do I lead worship now and like stand in the authority that I believe God has given all of us how do how do I do that I don't know how to do that my I go to do it and I feel myself shrinking back because it felt like and he just talked do you mean it felt like the enemy just went I'll show you yeah okay and I'm like what how am I going to do this and and Bill was so beautiful and just scripture after scripture after scripture about declaring the goodness of God and he said like right you know this is going to give your faith a job now right this is going to require faith but actually part of the fruit of the spirit is you have the peace of God and you as you keep clothing yourself in in the all of the garments that God gives us to cover ourselves in, said you're going to have to be super intentional about that. And then Mark said, well, this is going to have to be a steel trap. You're going to have to be really watch your thoughts. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to take them captive. Like all those things that we hear and we're like, yeah, yeah, that's good. I'm like, actually, I I seriously have to do this now. So, you know, it was really... 
and and still to this day like I'm a lot more intentional mm. about what I allow in here and you know, that's a gift from cancer mm. it does give you gifts yeah mm. it does give you gifts along the way that was Darlene Check speaking to me, Jemima Wright, here on Premier Christian Radio. You can also read this interview in the latest edition of Premier Women Alive magazine. See our latest subscription offers now at womenalive.co.uk. We'll be hearing more from Darlene Check right after the break. Which of these topics has not been covered on premierchristianity.com? UFOs, near-death experiences, Doctor Who, Christ's return, the faith of celebrities, and Andrew Tate. Trick question. We don't shy away from any topic. We cover faith as it affects us in daily life and give you the bigger picture. PremierChristianity.com. Special podcast subscription offer at PremierChristianity.com slash podcast. To go back to your church, your your. I think your husband said you want to go on an adventure and you thought he said he was meaning fly fishing. <laughs> yeah, I did because ideas. I've been wanting to go fly fishing <laughs> for years Have and we were always yet? so busy. We did. <laughs> oh, good. We did. And he said, do you want to go on an adventure? I'm like, oh, are we going fly fishing? He no, I'm in a church. I'm like, oh, Lord, really? Yeah. yeah. And so what happened to him? He, he God had just said, is this something you want to do? Do you know, it was really, really random. I don't know that we've even told this story to anybody, but maybe one person. On the same night, we both had the same dream, a really random dream about us taking on a particular church. Oh, And wow. I, when I, I said to Mark a few days later, I said, hey, I've got to tell you about this dream. It's really random. Never had anything like it before, but it's so real. I feel like I can still smell the smells and touch the buildings. And he's like, really? I had one too. So we started telling each other it's exactly the same dream. And up until that point, we had said we would never lead a church. But this dream was about us leading a church. And um, we heard that this church that was in our dream was looking for a pastor. How did like, you know about the church? It, it's a, the church that I got saved in, actually. Oh. So it was really random. And Mark's like, well, maybe that's maybe that's it. Do you want a pastor? I'm like, well, not really. Do you? Mm. And he goes, well, not really. But this is what God's saying. And then, like, the next day we found out that that church had found a pastor oh. and we were both so disappointed. And then we're like, uh oh, because God had awakened something in both of us separately, miraculously. And then he's like, I think this is what we're going to be doing. And I'm like, oh, Lord, have mercy. Okay, here we go. Because I felt exactly the same. Wow. So, yeah. And, and how was it then stepping into a role that you hadn't wanted to do? And if you're someone that does like being in the background, pastoring is very, you know, on stage. How, how was that transition? Or did God just give you grace for it? Yeah, he has given us grace for it. And he has, and we're doing it together. And we, we've got an amazing team and we don't build the church around us. So, you know, I don't even call it a stage. I call it a platform. I stage, I say to our team, it's, it's like asking you to perform. Yeah. So, you know, we're... We just have, we build it around, you know, there's lots of people. We're building around just discipleship and loving people and, you know, the worship of God and the word yeah. of God and community. And I I really, I really love it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I can't believe I really love it as much as I do. But one thing that I loved at Hillsong, there's lots of things I loved about Hillsong, mm -hmm. um, and toward the end, you know, there was that frustration in us and sometimes I think God allows that to get you moving, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Not about everybody else but to get you moving into your next. Um, one of the, my favourite things as a pastor, I, I'm like when you say worship, even the worship leader, I'm more a worship pastor. I love 
shepherding yes. people. I even when I'm leading people in worship, I see myself washing their feet. That's my picture. Oh wow. Washing their feet so they see Jesus, serve them well so they see Jesus. That's always my picture. Wow. And so actually that and that was my role at Hillsong in in midst, you know, I pastored a lot of people. And that was my favorite thing. So the songs and all that was awesome, but the pastoring is so actually that going into being lead pastors at our church felt very natural and very lovely. Mm. Back in the hospital, back in the, you know, I just love it. Yeah. And so God has given us a grace for it. We're on year 14 now and we've got, you know, campuses and, you know, things happening here, there and everywhere, but it doesn't feel like a pressure because it's not built around us doing everything. It's like we do our bit and then everybody's doing their bit and, yeah, trying to honour their families along the way. Yeah. So we get it wrong and yeah. we get it right. And we're just like, we're having a go. Yeah. <laughs> um, that is one thing I noticed. I looked up the website and I saw that you have, um, is it satellites or campuses in America, in India, a few in Australia? I mean, from it being 14 years old, it seems like it's grown extraordinarily. So you, you came from a mega church, but I don't know what size it is, but it just seems like you, it's flourishing. Yeah, it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. And um, like we, you know, we love India. Well, we love the developing world. Um, yeah. We've done, you know, it's, I guess it's part of our makeup. Mark's father and mother spent a big time, a, a lot of time in mission work after they got radically saved when he was a teenager. And so it's deep in him and it's yeah. just always been deep in me. Mm. So, you know, it's felt very natural to be in India. Um yeah, it's really beautiful. We have a campus in Calcutta mm-hmm. and it's just my favourite, favourite place to be. Yeah. I love it. Um, did you send people from the local church to Calcutta or was there the people in Calcutta that... No, oh, so it. one of our yeah. campuses in um, Hyderabad, actually, there was a beautiful family who um, had connections in Calcutta and they just really felt the Lord was calling them back into Calcutta so everyone you know they're all um Indian people leading Indian churches and um because culturally it's you know very different but in a spiritual cultural sense it feels like home yeah when we're there yeah Yeah. body of Christ um yeah that's amazing and then so was it from when you started the church you started hope global or was that before um you it was had... quite a long time before actually okay. yeah Tell um, us about that. yeah yeah hope global we were actually um visiting our compassion kids in uganda we had um our two daughters there with us our two eldest daughters and then we went to into Rwanda, which is quite close to Uganda. Into Rwanda, we'd heard about the genocide, but we didn't really understand it, you know. And once we were there, oh, it just it, it got us, and and we felt quite ashamed. We're like, how can this have gone on so recently, and we not be really desperate for these people while we're living our sweet lives in Australia. Um, so we really just wrestled with God why, while we were there, like, God, what, what are we doing? We want to do something. And um, God really spoke to my husband on the plane. We were going to Nashville after that. I was receiving a, an international award somewhere in Nashville so you can't go from the, the culture difference is oh like you know, you're in the dirt, yeah. weeping with people to someone's doing your hair and makeup. To yeah. go, and I'm like, oh, this is messing with my head. Yeah. Um, but on the plane, my husband heard God say to him, now that you've seen it, what are you going to do about it? Just like that. 
Wow. And so when we got to Nashville, he started asking people, hey, if we step out, would you be interested in coming to Rwanda and serving the people there in whatever it is that you do, whatever God has gifted you do, would you come and do that and serve the people of Rwanda, not come in with how we think they should be living their lives, but just come in again and come under, ask the people what do you need and let's serve them to that end. So over, you know, uh, about an 18-month period, we came up with this thing, Hope Rwanda, 100 Days of Hope, which we had spoken to the government and you know, they do a hun- they did 100 Days of Grief. Mm. And we're like, well, can we replace that with 100 Days of Hope, wow. honouring those who lost their lives but talking about future and future generations, which they eventually agreed to. And so we did 100 Days of Hope. We had the you know, Prime Minister and all of that. And it has been an amazing thing. It's still going to this day. We bought land there. We're developing a training centre to train young people in ministry or, you know, as doctors, nurses, um, whatever they need, providing yeah. a place where we can provide training because education mm-hmm. is, you know, so important. So anyway, lots to tell you about that. But then it, other countries started asking, hey, would you guys come and do something similar here? Um, Mark's best friend who oversees the churches in India, he is a, him and his family have been missionaries in India for 35 years oh, as wow. American missionaries. Him and Mark have done business together and ministry together for a long, long time. So he's like, yep. Yeah, let's see what we can do in Vietnam, let's go to Africa, let's go other other places, let's see what God opens up. So it's been phenomenal. Wow. And, um, again, great team, volunteers right now are in Rwanda. We've had hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of teachers go into Rwanda over the many years now and just go and serve the people the Rwandan government allowed us to set up the curriculum for early childhood. Um, now they have a university. They never had a university. I mean, it's just favour, 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 and a lot of people's hard work and sacrifice. Yes. You know, there's. I think we've got our staff is like someone three days a week doing admin and everyone else is volunteer. Wow. And you know, I think over that first 100 days of hope, we had about 2,500 volunteers go into Rwanda to serve the people. And, you know, the country, it really has has made a significant difference. And now we're, you know, just trying to serve people in other areas where God kind of opens up a certain area to us through yeah. relationships. So that's kind of what we're doing and, Yeah. It just seems best. so like God that he gives you this worship song, you shout to the Lord, and the overflow of that is that he's he's going to the poor because I... he's being obedient, but that just seems so like God. That's so beautiful. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, I'd love to talk about Testament. So this is your new your new album. Mm-hmm. What's the mm-hmm. background of that? Where Where's that come from? Yeah. Well, when Shout to the Lord was turning 30, um, my kids actually said you should do something mm. to commemorate that. Like, Mum, that's a really big thing. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like I didn't think much about it. But then I started thinking about really, oh, I get emotional, just the faithfulness of God. Yeah. I'm like, who am I not to do something? Like I felt this real fire in my belly to do like a legacy project, really, you know, because I have six grandchildren now um, and all my kids are married. My youngest one got married last year and I I really wanted something for them to go, do you know what, God's faithfulness, no matter what we're going through, our families, we've got lots of things happening, Mm -hmm. but God's faithfulness trumps all of it. Mm -hmm. And that's how Testament started. So my son-in-law, 
one of my son-in-laws, Andrew, and my daughter, Amy, his wife, they wrote Testament with me. Um, and, yeah, they've had some significant challenges in their family. And I'm like, what do you want to say? Mm -hmm. And Testament is like, you, even though I can't see it, what I really am hoping and believing for, I can't see it, but I still know that my Testament is you and I chose that word testament because actually testament is more of a legal phrase mm. like that last will and testament it's like yeah. that testimony can't be um disputed mm. it's final it's like you know in, in revelation when it says they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony it's like testament is like it cannot be disputed mm -hmm. this is what happened this is the word this is the life of God in me and what he's done in me and no one can take that away yeah like so that's where testament came oh, from yeah wow that's so beautiful that you are writing with your daughter and son-in-law it was that the first time you've done it or is that something you've been doing for a long time We've done lots of bits and pieces over the years. Yeah. yeah. Like the family all ebbs in and out. You know, on, we did a choir session. Have? I have three daughters. Okay. Yeah. And now I have four granddaughters and two grandsons. Wow. Yeah. And yeah. have they all inherited your musical gene? In some way, like yeah. all the son-in-laws can play or sing or, you know, they, yeah. they've all been involved in that. All my Like my two eldest daughters travelled with me when they were younger and then they would just sing because, like, hey, of course. Yeah. Um, and then Zoe, she leads worship and she's one of our youth pastors Um and she sings with me on Shout to the Lord. I wanted to do a new version of Shout to the Lord with her and it's with the Australian Christian Orchestra oh, and it's wow. really, it's beautiful. Yeah. And I'm just like, so you you take it, like, again, that generational awesome. legacy, mm. the faithfulness of God is very intentional mm. in, in my heart, this project. Yes, tell the next generation what he's done. That's so good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love that. So I've <laughs> so in, in um just finding out more about you, I've listened to some brilliant podcasts with you talking to Martin Smith from Delirious and Jay John. And it seems like you yeah. have such um close connections with people in the UK. Is that just because of no. you, you had a worldwide ministry, or is there some other connection okay. with the UK? There really isn't like a, a we don't have fair like my brother actually lives he's lived in Swindon now for 20 years oh, and yeah. he's a very successful um, musician over there oh. um but apart from him no but I think what captivated me like when I was I was a worship pastor really young mm. and I'm like there were no books there was nothing out there but I found Graham Kendrick in the UK and I found Jack Hayford yeah. in the USA. I'm like, I am somehow going to get to know these people because I need to know what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> and you did. Just, and I did, like through yeah. just over years I, I would go and like I didn't, I wasn't like a stalker with them, but again, I'm like, Lord, I really need to, these people need to speak into my life because yeah. you're doing something in Australia and we don't have the history. Mm. We don't have the spiritual history. We don't have our own spiritual story yet, like especially the UK, mm. that the, the thread of the majesty of God through mm. hymns and worship and, like, it, it's staggering the history that you have in worship. And I I have just been hungry to learn, like, what is this about? Why do revivals have a sound of worship attached to them? Why? Like, I'm a bit inquisitive. Why Azusa Street? In, in Like, why was there this, this, this sound, these, these anthems coming out? 
And, and I've just been really inquisitive and hungry, hungry for the presence of God and hungry to know what has preceded where we find ourselves today. Mm. So, you know, yeah, I have read, then I started to read anything that Graham had put out or mm. then I got to know Martin, you know, cutting edge. I started listening to their music. We had all these beautiful young men in our team and I'm like, we've got a piano-led worship. I'm like, these guys are all on guitar. Yeah, There's got to be another way. We've got to release the guitarists. And, you know, I have I shared on um, the podcast I did with Martin recently that when Cutting Edge, before they became delirious, they were on their guitars and I'm like, this was radical. Um, the vineyard. You know, yeah. some of that stuff, it was still very piano driven. So, yeah, the UK released something really sweet um, mm -hmm. and beautiful with that, especially with our young men. Yeah. They saw something they could aspire to. And uh, it was very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. So, the UK has a very special place in my heart. That's so cool. Um, yeah. My final question maybe a bit random but it's about mothering and just hearing you speak yes. and seeing you from a distance for you know over 20 30 years even when you were you know a mum of young kids mothering seems to be like an anointing on you or I don't know what it is and I heard you say about worship that there's a nurturing in worship of, of bringing us together into the presence of God yeah. can you speak on that yeah, it's a hard it's a hard one because you know in my own personal mothering, like it is my greatest marriage and motherhood is is just the thing I love the most. Mm -hmm. It's the thing though that I probably um, struggled with because you know I had been living on my own since I was fifteen, and there was a there was a very not my formative years, 10 to 15, I was working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was like, so when I, when I hit, you know, we got married, I was 19 and I had this image in my head, my little white picket fence mm -hmm. and my two little babies, a boy and a girl, and my husband and I was just going to be this perfect mother perfect wife you know when I went to give birth to Amy I actually put a ribbon in my hair and put makeup on because I'd seen this Johnson and Johnson ad of this beautiful coiffed mother yeah. with her brand new baby not a hair out of place I'm like that is going to be me <laughs> like so I had this picture and I've got a great picture that my family one day I'll put it in a book We'd it's love me to holding it. Amy, my Isn't Johnson and Johnson picture <laughs> with my ribbon around my neck. It's fantastic. It's Sounds just brilliant. like I've got makeup under here. It's like not the picture I had in mind. <laughs> but, you know, because I'd always worked so hard from a young person mm. and then I worked really hard as a young mum, I'd work into the night, I'd try to give my girls the best in the day. I, I just worked, worked, worked. There was a season there that, you know, my ability to mother well, was, I wasn't giving them my best and I had to make some big adjustments. And But it's always been my, my heart. I guess, you know, we're always a product of our upbringing, right, and I yearned for family, just for family. And that's why I loved the church so much because when I got saved and I walked into the foyer, I was 15, I was living I was renting a little room wow. in a single mum's wow. house and I walked in and, you know, I'd been on television so people kind of knew me a little bit, but I was still a kid. Mm -hmm. I was just a kid. Mm -hmm. And so the music minister and the choir director just scooped me up like family, wow. didn't ask me to do a thing. They discipled me, sat me at their table, you know, just loved me mm -hmm. and I've, that gave me this picture of the church. This mm. is this is the church I see, God, in my heart, that you want to sit people at your table mm. and you want to nurture them to community and to you. Mm. You know, and so mothering for me then, you know, then 
I found myself really good role models, like Anna Smith being one of them, Martin's wife, mother of six. Yeah. Um, yeah. A role model, younger than me, but a role model for me. Mm -hmm. Lots of conversations, um, family holidays together. And I, I literally have been a learner, a lifelong yeah. learner. Yes. And, you know, so I, I, it is my greatest privilege mm -hmm. to be a mum. But in, in worship, my heart is that I will nurture people to Christ and they won't remember me, mm. but they will remember the safety that a nurturer brings so that all the barriers are removed and they can see Jesus. That's, that's my goal. That's it. I don't have another job. That's it. That is such a good place to end on. And I really want to um, <laughs> just focus on what you said. They won't remember you because that is so against our, you know, our human desire for praise and affirmation yeah. and all of that. But yeah. know that they won't remember you, that they would be safe in the presence of Jesus. That, yeah. Wonderful. This is, that's our, that's our job, right? Whatever it is that we're doing. I mean, you're doing it now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you thank for allowing you. me to be here with you. You've been listening to The Profile in association with Premier Christianity magazine.